My name is Samira Salter. I was born in Barry in Vale of Glamorgan and um, have spent 16 years of my life there. Um, from the age of 16 I moved to Cardiff and spent two years in Cardiff with my um, husband's family then. And from there I lived in Saudi Arabia for 13 and a half years and Yemen for a, a year and a half. My background is my mother is um, my mother's mum was Greek um, and my grandfather was Welsh from um, Gilbert Cork, which is one of the coal, you know, vast sort of industrial areas where they had the coal. He was a, he was a miner then. Um, my father's from Neath. Um, I come from a large family and seven brothers and I have another sister so there, there was nine of us all together um, and although I would have thought that um, we would have been very close and, and I can remember sort of them days people were poor especially when you had large families uh, you know, my father was a carpenter my mother stayed at home um, to look after us so I can remember being um, poor but um, well fed <laughs> which is amazing really <laughs> because we ate off our land everything was grown from our land so um, um, we were fortunate um, one of the fortunate ones I'd say that uh, my father was quite very very skilled and and used his resources to um, also enough keep us alive I suppose and um, the earliest memories of we had. I was fortunate to have a really good childhood. Where I was grew up in Barry, we had the um, the beaches. Um, we had the woods. So it, 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 you know, our mother would pack us off in the morning, nine o'clock in the morning. I can remember walking down, it'd be like a two mile, three mile walk to the beach. But it was nothing back in them days. Um, so we'd go to the beach. We'd have some, you know, sandwiches and stay there for the whole day. Come back home seven o'clock in the evening. So the summers was absolutely brilliant um, um, many years ago, and that was the same for all of us. Things obviously, as you get older, things change. <laughs> so it's like um, I just felt myself um, personally. Um, I didn't come from a religious family at all, um, but I always felt that um, I believed believed in God, always did from a very young childhood, I felt that presence. So I started to go to Sunday school. Um, and then I went to Sunday school until the age of 15. Um, from there then, so that was a, a real, I could say, memorable experience for me, uh, a significant in my life, uh, you know. Um, and I felt I was coming away from my family in, in a sense. Um, and now, going through my life experience, I did, because I met my husband, um, who was um, Yemeni, and he was a Muslim. Um, when I met his family, um, I just, in my heart, I felt, knew, I knew that I was, puzzles fitted together. I felt complete. Um, I'd, I'd have to say on reflection, um, I was probably lost a bit and I felt like I was in a household of people that were my family but really didn't a bit detach from them um, and I felt like I'd come home uh, that's how I can exp I can say the feeling for me was I've come home this is where I'm supposed to be um, and I adapted to the Yemeni culture um, I changed my religion um, uh, and I was Muslim because I was Christian before that just because it felt right for me. It, you know, that was, it, it just felt right. And like I said, I felt home. Um, got engaged at the age of 16. Um, 18 then, I um, got married and went to live in Saudi Arabia for about 13 and a half years. My eldest child was born out there, um, and which was a very, very different experience for me. I was, a, I was a young girl that never been out of, didn't go out of Barry until the age of, sort of 10 or 11 one time coming to Cardiff shopping but then obviously going 
to a completely different country. I understood a, um, a f few bits of um, Arabic, just a, just a small amount. Um, I'm thrown in the deep end here, didn't know anybody. Um, nobody spoke English. So I felt I had to adapt very quickly because obviously my husband then used to go to work and I was left at home. Um, but I lived in an apartment block where there was lots of different nationalities, you know, Arabic nationalities. So just in a lift one day, um, I started talking to somebody and we used to have coffee mornings in because all the husbands used to go out to work then, so we used to have coffee mornings in each other's houses. So I was very fortunate to learn different accents of the Arabic language. Um, I also worked in a hostel over there um, as a medical clerk. So that was interesting as well because I met other people from all over the world then back in the early 80s, um, Australia, America, New Zealand, all various Arab, uh, Middle East country, uh, Middle Eastern countries, and I had a really good life. Um, and then, after so many years, I, w I was there in the nineties when the Gulf War was on, and that's when um, we decided to um, go away from Saudi, um, Saudi to Yemen, which is my husband's at then his co his country is Yemen, so. Um, because we didn't know how the Gulf War was going and we had children, it was quite scary because you had the, you know, sort of the B-52 bombers going over you and, you know, media then in, in Saudi Arabia, you're very, very much cut off. So um, that's all you're getting is just one sort of thing coming from the media, you know, you better put um, on the air condition, is it plastic and all that, a fear of chemical war. So it was very, very um, nerve-wracking and um, frightening time, and especially when you know I had children. So we made that decision to drive on one Friday morning, um, 13 hours um, across many borders to go to Yemen. And <laughs> ironically, the morning we arrived in Yemen, five o'clock in the morning, the war had ended. So, but it was fine because it was a different experience, different life experience for me. Um, again compared to Saudi Arabia, because Saudi Arabia had a lot of restrictions for women. Um, I arrived there and I absolutely loved it. The freedom that um, a woman has, you know, to drive and um, obviously lots of family there, because my husband then is from Yemeni, um, he's Yemeni, so that was his country. Um, very, very exciting time. I travelled, we travelled to different parts of the country, cities and villages and um, I just learned, to, um, gained a lot of experience and knowledge of um, um, different cultures, different tribal cultures as well because although you know you think you're from one city, I mean here in, in Wales, we're, f we're you know from Wales and the, you, you may adapt the Welsh culture, there you go from different villages to villages and they have a different food type of things or different you know utensils they may use for something it, it was completely different everything was um such a learning um curve for me um and i and i loved it i really enjoyed it and it, you know the terrain for me the weather was really really nice and um i just didn't want to come back actually i adapted so well um didn't want to come back to this country but unfortunately my husband had to came back because his parents were living here and we came back here. My father-in-law, um, well, my ex-father-in-law, I should say now, um, he was a seaman and he came here, as many um, Yemeni seamen did back um, over 50 years ago now. Um, and actually, they obviously, because we had the big docks here then, wasn't it, years ago, and a lot of them came through Portsmouth or, or and then down to, down into Wales, a lot of them come into Wales as well. And I think because Butown, because that's where my um, in-laws live in Butown, and everybody that was from a BME community, black minority ethnic community, seemed to congregate in Butown <laughs> because they uh, they were catered. They had mosques there, um, which people had been previous to that. That sort of even they had mosques and houses then until they could raise enough money to build um, the mosques um, 
here small mosques, but obviously, you know, as time went on, bigger ones. But they enjoyed, I think they enjoyed the, um, the Welsh people. They said, so friendly. The Welsh people are so friendly. Um, and they didn't experience, I suppose, as much racism as they had when they first initially came in Portsmouth um, and that way um, compared to here. And, and I think this is why they've settled in Butte Town and lived in Butte Town most of their life and haven't gone up because this is their um, second home, I'd say, um, for them. A lot of the, And a lot of people say this is their first home now because for 50 years they haven't been back home. So that's why I think it's the, it's the people, it's the Welsh people that make them feel comfortable and welcoming. I think it's about, I mean, you get different, obviously when you get somebody come in from abroad, they bring along their own cultural things with them as well. That could be um, music, dance, um, spices, um, all that was sort of in, you know, introduced then into sort of a Welsh culture. And I think it's the variety and diversity of things. Um, Welsh people have, for me, I think Welsh people have a tolerance um, and acceptance. And it's feeling everybody wants to feel accepted. You know, especially if they're away from their own country. You know, the, the language is completely different. Um, and I think in Wales, um, it's, it's about they're feeling accepted and, and want to be included into the Welsh culture as well. Because a lot, you know, you, you have your own culture, but you have the culture where you're living as well. And you have rules and laws and regulations that you have to adhere to. So, and, and that's all incorporated in, within the culture aspect of things. Um, and I think that's what, um, that's why people stayed so long, I think, in, in, in Wales. And obviously, more time or not, it's, they can relate, because this might be familiar countryside to, the, to where they come from. The hills, I mean, if you've got the valleys, when you have these small villages, it's like kind of back home. Even with the same, you know, tradi um, traditional way of doing things or, or use new utensils or we still have old, very, very old Welsh customs of doing things. And in some areas they're still used, no, not maybe so much in the city, but if you go out, I mean, you know, it's very much done in the traditional way. Um, and I think we have a very strong traditional in the Welsh heritage, very strong traditional um, way of doing things. Since I've been back, I actually, um, I used to teach English as a second language. Um, I did that within the um, Butte Town community um, for Yemeni women, um, because they were sort of, they wanted, they asked me, they approached me and asked me to, um, um, to do some classes, which I set up some um, classes in the Pavilion um, Youth Centre uh, many years ago. Um, so that was twice a week, and I did that on a voluntary basis because I had children, so I wasn't back, uh, didn't go back into work then. So it was a voluntary thing for the community, um, and also I used to um, do this sort of welfare issues, whether it was you know uh, benefit forms or immigration forms. Um, I was the port of call; everybody would knock my door, and I would do that for them. So I'm very much involved with the community that I lived in. Um, and well known in the community, you know, within Bhutan, within the Yemeni community for doing things like that. Um, I had my, I had children, but when they went back to school, then I went in to do voluntary work, and I actually worked for Citizens Advice Bureau within Bhutan, and we had um, early 90s big influx of um, refugees from Somalia. So I, I, away from dealing with sort of um, benefit issues and debts. There's lots of sort of immigration and visas and things like that. So I did that for a while um, on a voluntary basis. And then I worked for Short Start um, as a family health worker um, with not to four year olds, specifically within BME communities. Um, and that was sort of, um, sort of many things in their parent parenting classes we arranged. There's sort of any issues that a parent would have or would need support and help with. From there, I actually worked in a high school 
is a bilingual um, teaching assistant. Um, from there, I went to uni actually later on. Then I went back to university. Uh, well, I went to university as a mature student and did a, um, a honours degree in community youth and community education, which I completed in two thousand and ten. And I've worked on other projects. Sort of, it's always been sort of welfare and education work with women offenders, but it's always been community education, so it's always been out there in the community, um, which I love working within the community because I think that's where you get the best feel and you'll get the best um, knowledge of, um, of how to, I suppose, um, support a person. Because um, you're talking to real people, you're not sat behind a desk just ticking boxes. You know, these real. You're listening to real people's lives and stories, and um, and and supporting them in whatever whatever issue they have. Um, and for me, that is my line of work because it's sort of it's always following me around sort of community education, health and community education. I've worked. I worked in mental health many years ago, um, in the 80s before I actually got married um, in Ely Hospital. Um, and sort of that has followed me around to my present day after, you know, um, coming, going back as a mature student to university, doing a degree in youth and community education. I worked for a while in a youth club um, and then I wanted to do something for myself and for my own community, um, which I managed the Yemni Centre with another friend of mine for a, for a year. Um, and that was trying to get Yemeni women in to do things for themselves because we could see times were changing and, and system was changing of things um, and that women needed to be educated and especially among the uh, Yemeni um, population within um, Butown or anywhere else um, in, in Wales, they're the most underrepresented people. Um, you don't find um, women going out, a lot of women not going out to work. The younger generation is a bit more different, but the older generation, they were stay-at-home mums um, and now stay-at-home grandmums. And they are very, even though I know them and they were sort of, you know, I feel that they are my people, they were really, really, really hard to engage with. Um, so I, tr I tried that for a year and, uh, you know, I, I think I, obviously did some good things within the community because I mean obviously around health because we did some breast um, um, breast cancer awareness um, training with them um, sort of mental health um, also cervical smear sort of training with them so they understand diabetes so um, and some of them some of the women did actually take up the um, screening Whereas before there was a very very low intake of the, of these issues, so I think we raised the time I was there for a year. These things that were raised, um, a lot of the women did take them up, which was good, and I'm glad that they have done. And I'm hoping that they'll continue to take these sort of screen for different things up. Um, from there, I just felt that obviously with funding couldn't get money to fund wages there. A project wasn't a problem, wasn't an issue as much about um, wages and you can't live on fresh air. So um, I actually um, applied. A friend of mine told me that um, they were looking for a mental health, um, the ME mental health support worker within Diverse Cymru. Um, and I called up and, and spoke to Suzanne Devel, who is um, director of operations here and had an informal meeting um, and I started I think a few days later been here for two and a half years now on the BME mental health project Cardiff um, I, th I think it's very metropolitan which is um, I find Cardiff um, it's um, a small city compared to other cities I think I find the people really friendly um, and more accepting to other cultures and, and um, um, and I think it's a diverse city. It's, that's why I have personally. I've been discriminated against. Yeah, um, and and that was because of my religion, 
more, I think, than the colour. You know, it, it's not down to colour, but it was my religion. I was, and I was in a shopping um, supermarket with my daughter, and um, it was quite shocking to see, um, to experience that. Um, because the person was with a young child and I was more upset not at what I was uh, experiencing, the discrimination of get back to your own country. That wasn't an issue. It was that what that person was saying to me and how that reflected on that five-year-old child. And that child then, if we, if we are to break discrimination at all and racism, then we're not born with it. It's the environment you live in. And if you know, if you're if from your household, for instance, if if somebody is coming out with them remarks, and you have a young child, then that child will go on to learn that, unless they're told otherwise. Um, and that upset me more, is because the child experienced that, what um, what his mother was saying. Um, but I had a good response in a sense from that. I was um, that other people down the shopping aisle heard what the lady said. And, and wasn't having it and stood up and, and went to the store manager and said look I just experienced this I'm not having this and and they called me over and apologized and said that 80% of their workers from were from ethnic minorities and that you know we don't tolerate this um, this at all and the lady who actually disc uh, discriminated against me uh, was told to leave the shop and that was the I've been, you know, there, there's been discrimination when I've been in my car and, you know, people have called me, you know, wherever and get back to their own country and, um, which is now, I used to cry before, now I don't, I, you know, it's, it's sort of made me sort of stronger and think, well, you're a very ignorant person, you know, um, and it doesn't, but that, for somebody to say that, look, we are not tolerating this, you know, and doing something about it is that was really positive. From my experience, I, I'd have to draw on, and sometimes you can live in either live in like a, a cocoon thing within your own community, uh, and and then and that can, as seen within Butown, has been a melting pot. Um, um, with sort of lost community there, lost community um, sense of, of being and feeling because um, uh, big corporations have come in and sort of privatised everything or done a regeneration programme without really understanding um, what community means or, you know, what culture, different cultures mean and how they interacted with each other because um, I've never ever experienced or seen anything like Butang. Um and, and that was many years ago, and I absolutely loved living there. Um, I love my children being brought up there. Um, you have people which will w would say, oh, don't go down Butte Town. You know, this is trouble, this is that, this is that. Well, it's misconception of uh, people that people do have. Um, but the feeling of community spirit as sort of, um, that started to go when you have these big corporations coming in and sort of breaking down the community, segmenting it. And, and now I feel it's very segmented. Um, but what worked many years ago was it didn't matter what colour skin you was. It didn't matter where you come from. Everyone was treated as a human being. You were a person, you know, and, 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 and everyone was treated with respect and humi humility. It was, um, nothing was an issue. It was not an issue. Whereas I think the people themselves do not make it an issue. Other people make it an issue and other people make it a problem. And these problems are caused by, I think, sometimes systems um, and, and sometimes hidden agendas, I'd have to say. A lot of the time, people um, who do um, who are racist and um, who dis discriminate um, people. Um, I would say, like I said, nobody is born with it. It's learnt. And it's learnt through an environment that you're brought up in. Um, or peers or, or groups that you may um, um, belong to or, or go around. 
And I would say, if you, I, my motto is, if you don't know something, ask. If you're not sure why that person wears a scarf, if you're not sure why that person, you know, um, have got a certain clothing on, or, you know, where, whereas, for instance, uh, a lot of Muslims will wear a long um, um, white dress, we, we call it kameez. You go to the mosque in it. Um, to other pe uh, other people, might, that might be laughable and say, oh, look, that person's wearing a dress. But unless you ask somebody, well, why is that? And we all has it, have inquisitive minds of, of different things. Then you're not going to know. And I think it's the fear of not knowing. Then you become afraid of that person because to you that they, they may seem alien because they're not the norm. But to me, what is the norm? Because there's many of us that, you know, from different cultures, different backgrounds, even here you, ha you have different um, groups of people, you know, emos, or you've got, you know, years ago, I mean, years ago in my time, used to be the punks or the mods or whatever, you have different groups of, of people. Um, so I think I, I'd have to say, that person, who is the racist or who is um, would discriminate against someone else is actually either scared, so they're in fear because they don't know that person, and ignorant. And I think them are the two things. And sometimes if you actually speak to that person, um, you may feel that you have a lot of things in common. You may feel that you get on with that person so until you until you speak to that person, until you approach that person, you know, you're not going to know. You're not going to know. And I think it's such a shame because we can learn so much from each other. You know, there's so much diversity. We can learn so much from each other. Um, and always, what is the norm? You know, we, to me, that is not a concept because oh, that's normal what's the normal for one is not normal for another person so what is what is the norm normal mean to me and then and that concept means that you're following a sort of a systematic thing becomes because we've put them things there so we put our own barriers sometimes and our own walls up for ourselves um, and then it's harder to break it down and the more you get older, I think it's the harder you do, you know, you turn, um, it takes to break things down and build on that. How um, do we get... Me to share the culture. There are a few Yemenis, I mean, I don't know whether you've heard of Ghat. The, yeah, yeah. Look, uh, there's quite a few. Some people chew and some people don't. Um, I know the ones that that has two gats. They are sort of that's a social thing for them. That's a social thing norm that they would do back home. Not everyone does, but a lot of people do. Um, and they would sit down as a group, as a men in a room, and they would chew gat and talk about politics or, or about what's going on in the world. The you know the Arab world or you know um, general have that sort of conversation. With the women, it's different. They tend to get together if there's parties. So it could be engagements, weddings, it could be Eid, if there's Eid celebrations. Um, they t tend to get together like that. Um, or if somebody's had a baby, they, they, it's you know, you have to go and visit um, that person. Or if someone's ill, you go and visit that person. So you have that type of thing. But for men generally, for the ones that actually chew gat, um, they, on a weekly basis, they'll get together and talk about issues um, that are being raised, or issues that they have, and ish issues around the world. Um, tend to eat a lot of their own food. I mean, obviously now with children, they're having children, they've obviously um, gone to school here. Children will um, also like some of the foods that's here as well. But it, well, we're all going to say there's nothing better than mum's home, you know, cooking, is there? So, I mean, obviously they're going to enjoy their food as well. Um, and a lot of them, yes, they can access <coughs> a majority of things and there has been um, um, difficulty in the past few years because they've stopped the whereas before you could bring lots of different spices in 
it's been stopped now. Um, so obviously that's been controlled, um, what you can bring in and what you can't bring in. Uh, and obviously that's for health. It's, it's, in a, it's in the, you know, it's for public health reasons. Um, but most things they can, they can they can get, and what they what they're very very sort of resor resourceful because they what they can't get they'll make themselves, so they learned how to they bring their traditions and their skills here and they make their own things. So well, yeah. they have Eid events, which is Eid party for um, children, um, every year Eid parties, um, and that is after Ramadan and after Hajj, which is a pil big pilgrimage. So it's twice a year they'll have Eid parties, and they'll have Eid parties for women um, also. Um, so they're inclusive, and they can use their own community sort of centre. Um, also, they have weddings, and a lot of people will hire that for weddings. Um, so them are the type of events that they have there. I think um, to go to museum, it's being accessible. I, I think is the first and foremost. Um, I know a lot of the Yemeni community; they don't, especially the women, they don't like to sort of um, venture too far out of their own comfort zone. Um, or if they do, it have to be sort of not expensive. Um, so obviously, like for instance, a lot of them I don't think have ever been to the, uh, the museum within um, Cardiff, um, and and that is absolutely a wonderful museum you can go to which is free of charge um, and I think it's just knowing that they can access something um, and access something that's got their own history and culture and learn about their own history and culture and to see it so I think it's just having the um, knowing actually and and that's um, letting them know that what's on what's available and where's it going to be and how they can access it so the information has to be there, and I think information, in not, in not necessarily has to be in their own language either, because uh, you know a lot of the children now, their children read English. They've been um, studying here, so obviously English is their first language for a lot of them as well. But it's just having it um, being accessible, and it would be the money. Possibly the Yemeni culture, but I'm not so sure with all cultures. I think it'd have to be a variety of things that you'd have to do to attract all, all cultures, um, um, and not just one. And I think that would be, anyway, you'd have to do that to make it more, uh, to be inclusive to, to everybody. Um, <coughs> you would just be getting a flavour then of just one um, culture rather than get a flavour of all different cultures.